Okay, well, welcome everyone uh, to our session today. We're going to be talking about tips and tactics for amazing food and wine photography. My name is Dave Nershi, and I'll be the presenter today. And here's what we're going to be exploring in our session. First, we're going to be talking about some tips for creating outstanding food and wine photos. We'll also look at lighting, composition, and editing. We'll present some ideas for successful Android phone photography. And then we'll share some lessons learned. And hopefully along the way, we'll have some fun as well. So I want to give you a little bit of background on myself. I'm a certified specialist in wine. I have a background in journalism. I've been a newspaper editor and magazine editor as well. And I publish Venosphere, which is a blog that covers wine, travel, and food. And it's a really tough job, as you can see there. I'm hard at work uh, tasting some premium Pinot Noir from Willamette Valley. So when we're talking about food and wine photography, the aim, as I see it, is to visually convey the liveliness, color, and the flavors of the food. Your readers can't experience that themselves, so you've got to do it through your photographs. And if you don't have really compelling photographs, the communication, print or digital, is going to lack appeal, and it will sell your written words short. So uh, you can see a nice photo of sparkling wine there. And so just by way of background, I want to explain the equipment that I use. So my main camera is a Panasonic Lumix uh, FZ1000. And so that has a 20 megapixel uh, capacity with a one inch sensor. So a lot of the uh, bridge cameras, which is what this is, have a half inch sensor. So the sense, uh, one inch sensor is much more effective in long ranges and in lower light situations. It's got a 25 to 400 millimeter light dead lens, and it can also shoot 4K video. And then for my phone, and this will probably be uh, traded in in the uh, next year or so, uh, I have a Google Nexus uh, 6P, and that's 12.3 megapixels. So those are the uh, cameras that I'm using. I want to give a nod to contributors who helped me with this program. We've got Pamela Riley, so she's the publisher of Food and Wine Chronicles. She's a full-time blogger and a freelance photographer, and she's based in North Carolina. And then also Carrie Nershi, who is a really great person. She also happens to be my niece, and she is a uh, food enthusiast a food stylist and a photographer and she lives in Vermont and also she's very popular on Instagram she's got more than 51,000 Instagram followers and you can see the Instagram handles for both Pam and Carrie there so we're going to start off not with the greatest food and wine photograph ever but perhaps one of the worst and there's a reason why I'm showing this. So when you're taking uh, food and wine photos, it can happen in, in a variety of settings. So it can be your own home, a restaurant, special winery tasting, or a large event. And a lesson that I learned the hard way is that you always want to grab a safety shot. And so the shot that we're looking at there, my friend Steve had gotten a special uh, bottle of wine signed by the winemaker and we're getting ready to taste it and I hastily grabbed this really terrible photograph. What I've learned since then is you want to get a shot in the can because things are going to be happening and you get that one shot I could have said to Steve, Steve set that bottle down before you open it, let's get a nice little shot then we'll enjoy the wine but I didn't and it really made it unusable for my use later. So another uh, suggestion is uh, to get what I call an identifying shot. So this is really helpful if you're on a multi-winery excursion or a press trip, you're going to be visiting a lot of different locations. And so this is simply a shot 
uh, the winery or restaurant sign. Uh, here's an example here. Uh, it is a menu card from the Watermill Winery, which is in the Rocks District uh, in Oregon. And so when I have that, when you come back from your trip, you're looking through hundreds of photos and it's easy to forget, you know, one uh, vineyard of Cabernet Sauvignon looks like the other, but if you have a shot of the winery sign, you'll know where it came from. And in this instance, the Watermill Winery, you can see we have a very nice tasting menu, and wanted to mention, that's breakfast. So <laughs> that's another reason for making sure you get an identifying shot, because you might be tasting a lot of wine in the event. So, uh, Next, we're, uh, here's another identifying shot, and that is Pasatempo uh, Tavern in Walla Walla, Washington, one of the great small towns in America. And so we're heading there for lunch and a tasting, and I like that shot. Uh, the smoke you see is from a grill. They're uh, grilling uh, some pork for tacos over an open fire in the courtyard. Okay, so I want to start by talking a little bit about wine, and uh, we're going to try and answer the question, what do wineries want? Okay, first of all, wineries want to make sure that their wines are visible. So uh, that means the label should be readable, prominent, and that's also helpful uh, to you as a writer as well, because later you're going to be writing about these wines and you need to know if it's a 2016 vintage, a 2017 vintage, if it's from Paso Robles or Santa Barbara. So in photographing wine, the color of the wine is important. There's some amazing filters out there on Instagram and on your camera that you can use, but you want to make sure that in your photography of wine, you're being authentic. So here's an example. We've got a very nice uh, Fumé Blanc from Dry Creek Vineyard in Sonoma, and uh, that's another name for Sauvignon Blanc. Um, so we've got that, you can see the nice light color. So a light yellow green color in white wine indicates a young wine, while a deeper amber color will indicate it's an older wine. So here you can see a Trocken beer in Auslais from Austria, and that has a bit more age. It's a 2004 wine. And this was taken a couple years ago, but it was still pretty old. And over time, that wine has changed color and it has a much deeper hue to it. This also has noble rot, botrytis, which is actually a bacteria that gets into the grapes and starts living off the moisture in the grapes and leaving just that very sweet sugar in the grape. So this is a very special wine, but if you're using a crazy filter, you might end up with Sauvignon Blanc looking like the trucking beer in house lace. I don't want that to happen. So another area that's exploding recently is in Rosé. And I love Rosé because it's not only delicious, very food friendly, but it's a treat for the palate as well as the eyes. So, uh, here's a bottle, for example, from Adorada, which is a California uh, winery, and they focus on aromatics in their wine. So they blend the different grape varieties carefully so that the aroma is very distinctive. And they also, as you can see, label their bottles so it looks like a perfume bottle. And so in capturing that picture, you want to do it justice. You can see this Rosé has sort of a coppery color to it. If it's darker, it might look like a Rosé or a Rosada from Spain, which is a completely different animal. Here we've got a Carmenere, so that's a much deeper color, a, a bolder grape. And we'll talk a little bit later about having accessories that can make your wine photos interesting. And so here is something which I have never seen before. It's a glass doily that you actually put on the bottom of the glass and so we were visiting some friends and I put that on and I thought this would make a great photo and it was 
However, about two minutes later, I knocked over the <laughs> red wine all over the tablecloth. So that's my experience with that. Okay, so uh, here's another shot of rosé. And this is Provence. You can see it's a much lighter, sort of pale salmon color and really beautiful. So rosé, if you're looking for an interesting wine shot and food shot, rosé is really perfect. Not only is it a great match with the food, but it looks beautiful too. I also like to incorporate flowers uh, as well. So you may ask, if you have a really nice camera, why even bother with the phone? Well, uh, actually, as good as phone cameras have gotten lately, many people are asking the reverse. Why do you need a big, bulky camera when you have a smaller phone uh, that can do the job uh, just as well? Because uh, the, and here's a shot of a restaurant uh, in Eugene, Oregon that we visited on a press trip. The Oregon Electric Station, this is actually a, uh, an old trolley station. And the, the restaurant where we ate, it's actually in a trolley car. So this is a very small area, and I couldn't bring in a camera bag, and with that, a really large camera. So I used my phone. It's a lot less obtrusive. Uh, my wife, Kathy, who's here, uh, and I went to dinner at Cafe Pasquale's last night, so it's sort of an intimate, very small place, and you don't want to be uh, changing lenses and bringing out the camera, so your phone can be uh, essential in a shot like that. So here's a shot that I got at the uh, Oregon Electric Station, very nice shrimp and grits, and that is a King Estate Pinot Gris from Willamette, another really great wine, a very food-friendly wine. So uh, again, uh, we're going to segue now into lighting, but again, that phone camera, just so convenient, and uh, the comment was made uh, yesterday, you know, what, you know, a, a camera is not useful if you don't have it with you. You can't always, you know, say, I'll be back in five minutes and get this once in a lifetime shot. So that's the great benefit of having the, uh, the camera in your phone. Okay, so I want to segue now into lighting, and I mention that because it seems like the classier the restaurant, the dimmer the light is. So some of them, it's like you're in a cave, and you actually may go to some tastings in a cave if you're visiting France in a wine cellar. But, uh, you know, this is a real problem because with the light being dim, your beautiful steak looks like a brown, lifeless lump in the photo afterwards. So a trick that I learned, and uh, I know others are on to this, and that is for less than $10, you can get a ring light, also called a selfie light, that fits easily into your purse or your pocket, and it gives you just the right amount of light to, to light up your scene. So recently, we had a dinner on the patio. We have to review a lot of different wines, and I see Chris in the back is showing off her. You want to hold that up? Okay. There's a, our spokesmodel is coming forward to demonstrate the ring light. Vanna, let's see some movement. Uh, so this is a, you can get it on um, Amazon. It's about $8.99. Is it for iPhone or a regular camera? It's Maybe. for iPhone because, oh. I don't know. It doesn't attach. But it attaches. Yeah, it's yeah. for your phone. Yeah. It actually has a clip that you can clip yeah. on. So that's the, I don't use it for that purpose, but you can clip it on your phone and take a picture it of yourself. It has three different... Oh, I have one too, it's not the ring, but it's yeah. kind of the same. Okay, yes. Thing. So, I mean, if you're on a press trip, I kind of understand that, but like I was at a restaurant last night, a solo diner, and I feel very awkward. I always ask first. Um, some of the restaurants are asking you to turn in your phones now because they don't want people in their phones the whole time. You get ten dollars off your menu. <laughs> so that would be a little bit annoying. I was sitting next to someone and they have lights and pictures, but I don't have yeah, that all the time. You, you don't need to. You have to use your judgment, obviously. No, but it's a great little tool. It's very convenient if you're going in and it's a very posh place and it's it would be out of place. Don't do it. Okay. Yeah. So. 
Yeah, you still need to remember to bring it, and I have to remember to get my wife to carry it for me. So that's how that works. But uh, here's an example. We're having dinner on the patio, and for uh, a lot of the wines re we review, we have a, a different course of food prepared for each wine. We're starting here with a harvest bisque and spinach and strawberry salad with vinaigrette dressing. And so it was light outside, but it took a lot of time to prepare all the dishes and it started getting darker and darker. So we were losing the light. The shot on the right, which is a really great uh, Meritage blend called the Mariner from Dry Creek Vineyard, uh, we were losing the light using that ring light I was able to give just enough light to catch uh, some highlights there and illuminate the scene. So that's a uh, mojo pork with grilled oranges and avocados, a really nice dish. So I have to credit my wife, she's the culinary brains of the operation. So for 10 bucks, uh, that's a real good deal. Okay, so uh, moving into the lighting more in depth, Understanding how to work with light and shadow is extremely important. So here we see a nice shot. This is from the Valdeban Winery in Rivera del Duero in Spain, and they're pour uh, pouring some sparkling wine there. So light is going to give focus to your subject matter, and the shadow is what gives it depth. So for uh, food and wine photography, natural light, is most often ideal, but you do have a downside because bright light streaming through the window can create a very harsh contrast in your image. On the flip side, you don't want the light too diffused as this will lead, yield a flat, lifeless photo. So your goal is to create nice, soft shadows. And you can see in this one shot here, it's, it's nice and, and soft. So another suggestion, if you're unsure about how uh, the photo is going to look, is to put your hand where you plan to sh uh, shoot and see what sort of shadow it's going to cast. So you put your fist out there. Is it a soft shadow? Is it too stark? And you can move the scene or adjust your lighting. So that's a suggestion from Karen. Again, it's not hard and fast because sometimes pronounced shadows will set a nice mood. You know, you want those shadows. Um, so now we're gonna take a look at one of Carrie's shots. And this is a photo that sets the mood of drinking on a nice sunny day. So that's a real nice shot. I think that was for a magazine spread. It can also be nice when you have uh, glassware and beverages in the shot, as it will cast pretty shadows of varying shapes and tones, and also reflections. You have to be careful, but in this case, uh, we have some really interesting reflections that were created. That was at a uh, Merlot uh, master class that they had. Okay, so the direction and amount of the light is also important. If you have light coming from all around, it's going to kill the shadows and therefore the depth of your scene. So the preference is for one light source coming either from the side or the back. And we're going to take a look here. So this is one of Carrie's shots. Uh, she has a uh, sort of a neutral palette because she's trying to emphasize the, the food. And so here we've got the light coming from the side. And then here's another shot. Yes? Was that taken with an iPhone? Uh, this, all these shots are not taken with the iPhone, so that was not. Okay, so we're talking about general uh, food and wine photography, and then we're going to get into the uh, uh, Android phones uh, specifically in just a minute. Okay, so here's another shot where it's backlit. And you can see how uh, lovely those glasses look with the uh, light lighting them up. And there's a nice cheap cheese spread there. Uh, so that backlight brings a lot of life to the drink. Uh, if you are shooting with natural light indoors, be sure that you turn off any non-natural sources of light. 
Otherwise, you'll end up with pops of yellowy tones contrasting against the daylight tones. So here's another example of natural light coming through, and that's a wine called Golden Bordeaux. And so that's a sweet wine, Sauvignon, uh, from France around Sauternes with a, a spicy crab dip. But that, and this is an older bottle as well, about 2009, and so that gives it that beautiful amber color. And then here's one with brighter. This is shot with uh, my phone. Um, this is Willamette Valley Vineyard uh, in Willamette Valley. And so that's Pinot Gris and the very bright sunlight is hitting those wine glasses just right and sort of lighting them up brilliantly and uh, just creates a nice effect. Okay, so here are a couple of uh, pieces of lighting equipment that I use. I don't have an elaborate setup. On the right, you can see the ring light that I have, and you saw the actual one, so you can see it's really portable. And uh, to the left, I've got a light box that I use uh, that's got four GE Reveal uh, 350 lumen bulbs on it, so that's supposed to give natural daylight uh, effect. So I use that a lot for what I call glamour shots with the bottles. A lot of times I'll do uh, shots at restaurants or tastings, etc. but sometimes I just need to have a shot of the wine bottles. And so I also have a backdrop. This is a little more busy than the ones that I normally use, but uh, it's nice to get a shot of all of the bottles uh, in the can before you actually pour them, okay? So we're gonna talk, yes? Yeah. And I and I work really hard to get and I like your shot. Yeah. I, you know, but his preference is to not have like a, that white spot, you know, yeah. window reflection. And that's the hardest thing for me to get out. Uh, yeah, and we're going to talk about that in editing. Okay. But you can go in and edit and use a function called heal. Heal. Okay. Heal. heal. And basically, you're sort of taking the colors surrounding where that light reflection is and you're uh, you know, moving it over the bright spot. So uh, the reflections, I'm not uh, adamant about removing all of them because I think they can lend an interest to it, but if they're distracting, certainly you need to. I actually have one that had my reflection. <laughs> that's, that's what you need to look yeah, out for, it's... for sure. Okay. And so we're going to talk a little bit about atmosphere. So uh, here's a nice shot from Pam, and she's got a cheese plate with some white wine in the background. And so, you know, that, just looking at that photo puts you in a good mood. It looks light, airy. You've got the white theme going on. Okay, so the atmosphere is important when it comes to food and wine. And so uh, Carrie uh, says that what she likes to do is start by capturing an immaculate scene of the food and wine setup. So uh, just a note from Carrie, she says what she does is she'll start by having that perfect setup, she'll photograph that, then she'll have the people sit down, start enjoying themselves, serve themselves, sip the beverages as they normally would, and she's capturing that all the way. So you're getting some different looks and later she can go back and pick out what she likes the best. Uh, here, in terms of composition, this is another uh, phone shot. You can see you've got that road going off into the distance and the vines going back. And this is in Lodi, uh, out in Vineyard for Ironstone. Again, okay, just a, a couple more shots of people enjoying vino. And the wineries love this. You know, they want to see uh, people enjoying their wine, having a good time, uh, and you get bonus points if you have the bottle label uh, <laughs> exhibited there, playing it as you do on the right. Excuse me. Yes. So if you were taking a shot like this at a wine do you carry waivers that you, so that you're using that with people or with people? Uh, in this case, on the left, that is a winemaker. So she invited us there to take pictures of her wine and her. So in that case, it was not necessary. But I certainly, that's a wise thing to do. I wouldn't just randomly shoot 
people and put it on the website without their knowledge or permission. Yeah. And then on the right, those are our friends of ours. And there's another shot from Perry again. There's that uh, you know idea of people you know extending their hands in. So that's something that you feel you can be a part of. And that's a little holiday scene that she's put together. Okay, and that leads to another important tip, and that is you can never take too many photographs. So take them from all different angles. Uh, you never know when a photo is going to be botched. Um, you might have what you think is a perfect photo, and then you realize when you get back there's someone uh, standing in the background or the bottle is turned around the wrong way. Um, too many great photos have been ruined by someone blinking, photo bombing, or, or getting some, some blurry. Uh, so for composed shots, a tripod and your camera shutter timer helps avoid jittery hands. My camera's Wi-Fi enabled so I can set my camera on the tripod and then using my phone I can focus it, zoom in, and take the shot. And so that also allows me to easily take those photos and put it right on social media. So if you're using your phone for photos, you can also use a mini tripod and you can use a Bluetooth shutter release. Just plug in Bluetooth uh, into, the, into the phone and then you have a little shutter release and that's a way where you can avoid your jittery hands. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit now about color, and accessories. So to the right, uh, another trend that's out there is bourbon barrel aged wine. And in fact, the other night we had a, a rum barrel aged Merlot. And so there's a lot of that going on. So here are a couple of bottles uh, from 1000 Stories. And in the foreground, I have sort of an antique style globe. So it's not fully in the frame, but I sort of like the feel of that. It fits with something that's bourbon barrel. You got the wood, you have got the rivets there. And so I think that sets a nice scene. This is an Android photo that I took. And so I think it turned out nicely. Okay, so uh, my wife enjoys rummaging through resale stores to find unique tableware and decorative items that can be used in our photos. So this adds a layer of complexity, like this item that we see to the right here. Uh, also, don't discount the uh, value of unique glassware. Uh, even the wine's cork, the canters, cork screws, uh, they work well to draw the viewer into the uh, frame. A great and expensive way to uh, dress up your food photos is chargers these large plates on which the dinner plate rests uh, and a bit of color and style. They're inexpensive even when new and you can get them in a variety of styles to match different types of foods and seasons. And so uh, what Kathy will do is she'll actually get plates so we won't have a full uh, dinner service, but she might get one or two of these really unique pieces of tableware and we'll stage the food using those. Okay, so uh, brightly colored plates or a checkered tablecloth can set a fun mood, but you want to be careful. You want to use tones that aren't going to distract from your food, so you want the food to remain the focus. Okay, so uh, there's a nice shot. That is vegan ratatouille with Chateau Neuf de Pop. That's another uh, Android photo. And so I really like the shape of that wine glass, and I use that in a lot of different shots. And then you can see there's a deep green um, uh, plates there and napkin. So that's really nice. The bottle is also great because the Chateau Neuf de Pop, like some other wine regions, have embossed bottles. And so there's a nice level of detail there that catches the light and makes it interesting. And so here you can see we've got uh, different green plates. This is a spicy Asian salad. And the charger has sort of a bamboo look that sort of fits that whole mood of the food. 
that's a, a Sauvignon Blanc from Russian River Valley in Sonoma, which by the way, just to put a plug in for Sonoma, uh, wine country is open for business, so if you can mention that in your articles and let people know because they're hurting, people maybe canceling trips, not eating in the restaurants, etc. So if you can get the word out, I know they appreciate that. So here's a shot from Pam. Again, a nice subtle tone on the on the dish, and that's a tasting menu that she's about to dive into. And here again, we've got some golden Bordeaux, and that is with a dilled salmon. And you can see the charger has a little uh, bit of detail on it that makes it interesting. In North Carolina, they're known for pottery, and uh, an area in particular that's known for it is called a sea grove. And so this is a sea grove pottery dish that we picked up, and so it's got some unique colors, and I think it makes the dish interesting. You've got a shrimp skewer with an avocado dip, and that is a Michigan Riesling, which is really excellent uh, from Bowers Harbor Vineyard. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit now about scents and congruence, making sure that you have cohesive pictures that make sense. So you should be asking yourself some things as you're setting up your scene. Do the components of your shot make sense together? Does the wine pair with the food? Is the silverware, servingware appropriate for the dish that's there? Is the food prepared properly? So if you're capturing a specific time, you want to make sure that all of the elements are working together so you can see that uh, Carrie has set up a nice holiday scene and she's got some, looks like some holiday punch with maybe a, a port or a dessert wine and, and some other beverages in the background. So that works well together. I wanted to show this. Um, we reviewed a uh, rosé recently from Provence, Fleur de Prairie, and in reading the tasting notes, it said that it had uh, uh, aromas of wisteria. And I really like wisteria, and it never grew where we lived before in Ohio, but in North Carolina, it's everywhere. And this will be sometimes 100 feet up in the air on trees. It looks really beautiful. So when we saw that, we found some wisteria, trimmed it out, and then we used that in some photos and also a very nice table setting. So uh, flowers can add a lot, and you should try and match the character of the wine that you're uh, working with. Okay, just a couple of holiday shots. Again, these are uh, Android shots here that we're looking at, just using some seasonal stuff. Another shot. This is absolutely not congruent, but I wanted to throw it in there. Uh, a short time ago, my wife decided that the perfectly good chandelier in our uh, dining room needed to be replaced. And of course, the chandelier that she picked had like a hundred different dangling uh, crystals that had to be attached and 20 or more different pieces that had to be assembled in a precise order. And after wrestling with it for you know about two hours, I said, I need a drink. So we pulled out this rosé and we opened it up. And is this a composed shot that you would be aiming for? No, but it was really nice on social media. So I shot that, sent it off on social media. And then I also included a shot of the completed chandelier so it made a little bit more sense. So you can have fun with things that are intentionally not congruent. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about different camera modes as we enjoy this nice shot from, from Pam. But your main camera probably offers a variety of different shooting modes, such as nightscape, bright blue sky, etc. But your Android phone has that as well. So there are lots of different features that can help you take better food and wine photos. So you probably have a feature called portrait, or lens blur. So this enables you to photograph your wine in the foreground and your background in soft focus. So this is a great effect as it highlights your subject but creates a really interesting composition in the background. Burst, yes? I have a question going back to 
was, when you're at a Taylor press trip or a group and you've got a small table, everything's crunched up, it's a crowded restaurant, you can't move the food somewhere else, you're trying to shoot something and you've got forks and spoons and people's yeah. hands and everything in your shop. What, how do you deal with that? Well, I would, the most important thing is to remember to take a shot before you dig in. Because once you yeah. dig in, you know, oh, yeah. it's lost. It's so I, I don't know uh, that there's a, a, uh, one solution for that. I know that if Kathy and I are out dining, she will try and clear the decks for me and move some of the silverware. Uh, if you use this uh, uh, portrait mode or the blur effect, that means that those other items will be less distracting because they're going to be in soft focus. So if you're just taking a regular image and you see the fork in people's hands and so forth, that's not going to be good. But if you can blur it and diffuse it a little bit, that would be better. So uh, another thing that I do a lot of times, and we've got another suggestion here, uh, is that I tell people in advance, uh, I'll say, you know, I'm, I'm a, a food and wine writer, and I'm going to be taking some photos. Uh, I don't need to inconvenience you. But normally, if you give that preamble, uh, they'll cooperate. Yes? So Kathleen, when I'm on a press trip, and they serve us our individual meals, so if it's not a sharing <coughs> table, oh, yeah. if it's like I've got my own meal, once the people have taken their shots, then I will move to another table with that plate. Oh, yeah. so and I'll bring the silver or I'll bring everything and I'll just put it on another table if I really want that shot. So, well, you can do that, but in some cases when you just don't have that option and there's so much on the table and everything's on. Yeah, yeah, that's why I just take it to another table. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a great suggestion. And if we're doing like a wine dinner or something, we normally will stage one dish and then before everything else is served and that helps too but i like the other table suggestion so okay so burst mode i want to uh, talk a little bit about that so it's a familiar one on dslrs but you have it on your android phone too normally it's just holding down the shutter uh, so uh, food and wine photography isn't like shooting a football game but it's still a helpful feature and a great time to use it is when wine is being poured, especially sparkling wine. So when sparkling wine is poured and frothing, it looks heavenly, but just a few seconds later, that magic moment is finished and it's sort of flat. So if you're taking single shots, you probably missed it, but if you're doing a burst, you can go back later and pick out just the, the right one. Another great feature that I wanted to mention is HDR photography, okay? So that's high dynamic range, and it's basically taking two or more, usually three photos that are shot at different exposures and mashing them together. So this allows you to get detail in both the highlights and the shadows. Otherwise, if you're in, in a bright sunlight setting, for example, you're going to have very bright highlights and very stark shadows. But with HDR, you can still capture the best photo in that situation. So with my phone, for example, there's a setting for uh, automatic HDR that you can turn on, and when you're in that lighting setting, it will uh, do it automatically. Dave, there are also a lot of apps that you can get that will do okay. that. Yeah. Okay. There's one called a Foodie app that basically shines light on. It's called Foodie, and it kind of gets verticals. Okay, that's a great one. Foodie app uh, handles some of these features. Okay, so uh, on the left, you can see a shot using a lens blur on the Android. Uh, nice Montalcino, uh, red wine there, and corks sort of blurring in the background, and I've got a black backdrop there, so I really like that shot. To the right, you know, if you're uh, writing an article about a wine or a group of wines, it can be boring just to see shots of the bottles, and in the worst case, people just take stock images of bottles. That's no fun. But on the right, you can see uh, some corks that I took a picture of, and that's the top of the capsule there. 
You can use that as a detail shot that you can work in with the others just to create a little bit of interest. Okay, and there's lens blur making another uh, appearance with some nice Grenache from France. So we're going to continue with some shooting tips here as we look at some nice salmon with some Brunner Veltliner from Alabama Valley. Okay. So first, uh, this should be rather obvious, but make sure your lens is clean. That lens has been in your purse, your pocket, or a dirty table. So uh, start out by cleaning it. Okay, secondly, wanted to mention, don't use the flash because that is going to, you know, phone cameras now are really great in low light settings. Using the flash is going to give you a harsh and washed out image, very unpleasant. So I would say give it up. The DSLRs, they've got advanced technology that make flash photography more natural, but uh, you probably don't need it with your phone. Okay, uh, then third, don't zoom. Okay, unlike the zoom uh, feature in your main camera, the zoom function on your Android does not actually zoom. What you're really doing, unless you have an add-on lens or attachment, it's like cropping and enlarging a photo. So you're losing all of that detail. So what you have to do is zoom in with your feet. So move closer, stick your arm out a little further, and uh, that will improve the quality. And then once you get back home, you can do your editing with it. So we, we already mentioned taking a lot of photos, and when you do, get them from many different focal points, many different angles. Sometimes I'll want to focus on the food, other times the wine. And more often than not, I find that my last images are a lot better than that ideal picture that I thought I was getting at the beginning. So take a lot of shots, you can delete them later. Okay, so continuing on, we have a nice uh, shot there of some Vouvray on a, a summer day. That's uh, downtown Apex, North Carolina. And so you can see, we're going to talk about diagonal lines drawing you in. That burger is also drawing me into the picture as well. So, uh, okay, remember the rule of thirds when you're composing your photo. So. Uh, your phone probably has a built-in grid that can help you, that you can turn on or off. And so uh, basically you can, it divides your picture frame into thirds, horizontally and vertically, and where those lines intersect, that is where you want to place the main subject or the horizon line. And on my phone, I can turn it on or off it actually has a few other types of grids in there as well if you want to increase your creativity. So you should also look for diagonal lines to draw the viewer into the shot. So here you can see uh, the building uh, roof lines are sort of pulling down the street, the edge of the table. Uh, in fact, you even have people walking down the street to, to draw you in further. So that's a, a good composition that. Okay, and then you want to remember to shoot, if you can, during the golden hour. Okay, so the golden hour is the hour after sunrise and before sunset. So the sunlight really makes colors pop. It can make an ideal time for photographs of vineyards, buildings, or other outdoor scenes. Uh, here in Santa Fe, Santa Fe you know, some beautiful exterior shots of buildings during that time. Uh, it's really nice. It, uh, and also during autumn when the leaves are changing, it just sort of catches the color of the trees and, and lights that up. Okay, we're, we're going to talk just a little bit about post-editing. So you've gone out and captured hopefully some interesting shots. You're pretty pleased with what you've done. Now's your chance to edit them and, and really make them shine. 
So depending on the phone you have, you already have, you may already have outstanding editing capabilities. So I know with Google, it makes it really easy to crop, straighten, and if you want to use filters, they're already built in. Uh, so take advantage of those. I also wanted to recommend Snapseed. So Snapseed is my favorite uh, editing app for the phone and it's also free, which is not a bad thing. So you can choose from a variety of tools or preset looks. Swiping up and down allows you to choose different uh, settings. Swiping left to right allows you to set the strength of that filter or setting. So in a matter of seconds, you can edit your photo. And so that's really convenient if you're trying to get something up on Instagram quickly. Okay, one thing in photographing food and wine, look out for the crooked bottle. That happens a lot, and it can really ruin a photo, and it's easy to do, even though you think you have things lined up. With the editing software, it's quite easy. It's usually in the crop function. Uh, you can go in and just align that by a few different degrees, and that will straighten the bottle right up and make it a nice uh, photo. If you have a bottle that looks like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Uh, it has an unsettling effect on the viewer, but it's easy to correct. Uh, so Snapseed also allows you to clean up reflections or other problems with the heel function. We talked about that, uh, although I typically do that while working on a desktop program. I also wanted to uh, share something from uh, Carrie. A lot of glare and reflections, so she said she's had to Photoshop her way out of many serving spoons with the face, and so you can see that on bottles. Uh, if you're struggling with glare or reflection, they do have a dulling spray that you can use to fix the problem. Uh, however, I wouldn't suggest using that at a restaurant because any food <laughs> that it touches would be inedible, but it will work in a pinch. Uh, I probably won't be doing that since most of the food I photograph is, is usually my dinner. So, okay, so there's the heal function. I wanted to mention a couple of other programs, and the speaker just before me mentioned this, but it's a program I use uh, certainly weekly, and that's Canva. So Canva is a great program. It's free, although like all of these programs, it has a uh, deluxe version that you can buy. And it gives you a lot of great templates that you can choose from to drop your photos into. And then one of the features I use a lot are grids, which allows you to put together multiple photos. So if you're doing a photo of a press trip uh, to Willamette Valley, for example, you can drop in Photoshop at six different wineries, for example, and have that in one graphic and you can download it as a, a JPEG or a PNG. Another a program I wanted to mention is what I use for editing. It's simple for me and I need that. And that's Pixlr Editor, P-I-X-L-R. It's just an editing program when I need to do something on my desktop. It has all of the functions I need. And it's also good if you need to convert photos you know, from the full resolution down to a web-friendly size, uh, that will work for you, okay? And then I wanted to show just a fun app that I recently got on my phone. It's called Cartoon Pro. There is a counterpart for iPhones. And so this was during a trip to the Finger Lakes Domaine La Sour, which is a winery that focuses on French wines. We're tasting some Riesling, and that is the uh, our, our tasting room staff. And he just struck this really unusual pose like he's Napoleon or something. But at any rate, I got that. And then using this uh, Cartoon Pro app, which has you know, maybe 10 or 15 different uh, effects that you can choose from, it created an interesting graphic. So you can also use this if you're doing an article and instead of a photo, you want a graphic, you know, just something in general about food or wine. So I'd encourage you to uh, check that out. So uh, we're gonna wrap up with just a, a few photos that 
I enjoy that I want to share and that if we have any suggestions out there that people want to share about how they take successful food and wine photos, let's hear that, or if there are any questions or comments. But here's some nice shots. On the left, this is another trend I'm saying more of, orange wine. So orange wine is a, a white wine using white wine grapes where the juice is left in contact with the skins. Normally when you make white wine, you squeeze the juice and then you remove the skins. But here it's left on, and so it creates very unique uh, textures and colors. And here you can see, you know, there's no filter here. It's just that crazy, unique orange flavor, uh, orange color. And that comes from Vermont. Uh, so it's uh, really unique. And then to the right, we've got some sparkling wine from Breathless and Lodi. And uh, we talked about reflections earlier. Um, but something about the light and the grid pattern and uh, the, the lightness of it really appeals to me. Here we've got a shot of some kosher wines. Kosher wines are also, I would say, trending. And the quality of kosher wine has really improved. If you're thinking about Manischewitz or something, uh, put that out of your mind. And so here we've got uh, a, a nice wine from California. We've got uh, one from Israel. And then we even have a Chianti in there as well. So that's a nice shot uh, from, from Karen. And just a couple of shots to the left, you can see that's some eggplant dish, I believe. And there's the lens blur, and you can see that background is diminished. Um, and then to the right, we've got. Off of Larry yes. On your phone. If you hold it, if you have somebody who will work with you, you can hold it up with the napkin, you know, a couple layers of napkin, and then position it so you get the shadows right. You can dull that brightness and, mm -hmm. and diffuse the light with the napkin. Uh, that's a great suggestion, and I heard the comment earlier someone had made in a, another session, or maybe it was at breakfast, they were talking about uh, doing that with ring lights as well, so those lights you can use the napkin. Uh, any other tips that people would like to share? Any questions or, or comments? Okay. All right, thank you very much. My contact information is wonderful.